G'day and welcome to Panel Beaters, the car advice panel show. Can you smell that? <laughs> that is the smell of a brand new studio. Or perhaps that's my co-host, Trent Nikolic. How are you? I thought you were going to say you could smell my bad attitude. I still maintain <laughs> that this show should be called Beaten Favourites, with us three on it. I really do. And I'm not telling you what my new aftershave is. Right. Okay. I'm keeping it myself. Oh, yes. oh, to Octane? Yeah, well, <laughs> potentially, yeah. 98, Ron. Yeah. yeah. 98, Ron. <laughs> yeah. Jez, how are you? Yeah, very well. Hello, yeah. chaps. Okay. Uh, the best part about our new studio is that it's attached to the Car Advice office in Sydney. So mm. as we speak, there are people uh, working. Well, they're Looks sitting like they're at desks. Allegedly. On. They're sitting at desks. I can right see YouTube, there. Facebook. <laughs> Uh, Instagram, I think, further along. They're sitting at desks. They look like they're working. But this is where all the magic happens at Car Advice. And in this exact studio here is where we uh, record panel beaters. We also have a car here, the all-new Commodore, which we will check out later. We have stacks of car news today as well to run through, plus a couple of informational videos. <laughs> Firstly, what have you guys been driving? Uh, I've just gotten out of the Volvo XC60. Nice. Um, the, the most impressive thing about that vehicle for me is the way it rides. I was talking to Jez about it before. 21-inch wheels, and yet it rides oh, beautifully. Modest. Yeah, modest, exactly. Who thought you needed an SUV with 21s? And from the sublime to the ridiculous, I've gotten out of that and into an S-Class Merc, which you thought was a... Mate, it looks like a C-Class <laughs> or an E-Class. It's a very expensive C-Class. I'm C -class. not even joking. I'm walking into C-Class. Yeah, yeah, and I said to Trent, what's it's the letter on the back? Down-filled pillows yeah, for your neck rest in the back seat. Yeah. Massaging anyway. seats. Yes, what have you been driving? <laughs> well, I've also been driving the Volvo XC60 he because has. I'm comparing it with the BMW X3 in a very interesting twin I test. I like that comparison. Yeah, I like that. Two, yeah. two very yeah, good, good luxury mid size SUVs, yep. but I'm not mm. revealing the winner yet. No, of That's course. That's why I actually don't know yet. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been doing all He's going to ride yeah, the I, without yeah, driving. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it's fine. A uh, bunch of hot hatches, uh, M140i, Ooh, Civic nice. Type Par, yes. Focus RS Limited Edition. Yep. Very exciting. Also can't reveal the winner for that yet because it hasn't got online. Uh, and a couple of sports, sports cars, mm. Cayman okay. and a new yeah. four-cylinder Jaguar F-Type. Yeah, Let's get stuck tough. straight into some car news. <laughs> Fans of hot hatches are going to love some news from Renault. Trent, mm. fill us in. $45,000, boys. Have a think about that number. Forty-five yep. grand does not really buy you a lot these days in terms of performance. That's what we reckon the Renault Megane RS is going to be priced at. So $45,000 is your basic manual. About two and a half grand mm -hmm. for an automatic on top of that. Yep. And there'll be various limited editions and low production numbers. But I tell you what, judging on what we've seen, 45 grand, that's a hell of a lot of car for the money. What is the car? I mean, how much power does it make? What's, what's the big deal about the Megane? You'll race? have to go to caradvice.com to find that out. You can't tell everyone everything here. Well, I've done my research. You would have. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you were doing hot hatches. Why wouldn't you? Exactly. Well, that wasn't among them, unfortunately. It's but uh, 205 kilowatts, yeah, it's a I lot believe, of for the base model. But then there's going to be a trophy version, mm. which gets the cup chassis yep. and 224 kilowatts. So That'll in, be more expensive than the 45 grand. Yeah. Well, well, the 45, well, obviously, Renault needs to pitch against the Golf GTI. They so do. That's, that's your base model. Yeah. And then the trophy will yeah. go up against uh, a certain Honda. Mm. Here's my issue, though. Trophy, uh, it sounds fun and nice. Except trophy in Renault, French must be for firm, mm. because uh, Cleo, uh, you drive the trophy and, and it will literally... kidney belt. Yeah, it will here's dislocate your, here's your Here's your free kidney belt that you get Do you with think the Renault has learnt from this and the new Megane RS will be a civil car to drive? I would say being French, no. They haven't well, learnt. But, but this is going to be the thing. But the, you know, the thing that makes the, the Civic Type R so great yeah. is that it's a brilliant handling car, yeah. yet it's surprisingly easy to, to live with, much it's more than the, the Focus easy. RS. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. like R Renault's got to, you know, it's got to it's find almost, that balance. It's almost Golf R to live with, R, isn't it? It's, it's well, very, very impressive. Doesn't look like a Golf R. But the best part about driving an ugly car is that you don't have to look at it. So moving on from hot hatches to hatches, uh, <laughs> that will yeah. probably be hot one day, the Mercedes-Benz A-Class. So. It now has a front end of the CLS, yep. which has a front end of the Ford Mustang. Yeah. Um, so which looks kind of like, like an S-Class. Yeah, yeah, so there's, there's a couple yeah. of little connections to, mm. to join here. But mm. Trent, you had the chance to see this car, and more importantly, the tech mm. at CES. What yeah. is CES? The Where Consumer Electronics Show. Yes. And do you know what the best part about the Consumer Electronics Show was? Playing PlayStation? No. The oh. power went out for about four hours. So it was the Consumer <laughs> Electronics Show, Brilliant. and the whole place was in darkness for four hours. Oh. Awesome. Seriously, though, if I said to you that Mercedes-Benz was going to debut, yes, it's. Did you like the French pronunciation? I did. I that? Debut, that. not debut. Um, <laughs> their best infotainment system, the, the the highest end they could come up with. Mm. Which vehicle would they put it in? 
Well, it could be any because command is rubbish, so True. you could start on anyone. Yeah, but they'd usually put it in S class. Yes, of course. They're, put, they're releasing it first in A class, which is amazing. Okay. So you get in a small hatch, and it's got these two enormous screens. Yep. Um, they're interactive, they're, you know, they're digital, they're not traditional gauges anymore. But the MBUX that we're talking about, which is Mercedes-Benz user experience, the interesting part about that, and it's, it's hard to explain mm. to people unless they've experienced it, what you need to think about, if you've got an Apple phone, it's like Hey Siri. If you've yep. got an Android phone, it's like Hey Google. So what this is, this is manufacturers taking what smartphone companies are doing yep. and saying, we're going to give you our own system. Yep. So the thing has a connection to the internet. Mm -hmm. You're driving around, you're hungry. Yep. You say, hey, Mercedes, show me the nearest steakhouse. Yep. Hey, Mercedes, I'm too cold. It turns the temperature up. You know, hey, Mercedes, I sound like an idiot saying, hey, Mercedes. <laughs> They'd probably have an answer for that. I don't know. Can but you well, may. I, I yeah. just want to say how mm. stupid that sounds. Yeah, it sounds ridiculous. Not so much but the hey, hey Siri did too. No, at one but point, not, didn't it? not so much the Hey Mercedes. Yeah. It's more the the fact that these car companies are trying to be tech companies. Mm. I mean, but you know why? what? I was critical of that too. However, yeah, this is actually the best application of it that I've seen. And Mercedes Benz is very um, keen to emphasise the point that this is going to be a really good user experience. Interestingly. They've got cloud storage, so you can upload a profile. You can sell your A class, wipe all your information, give it to the new owner, buy a C class, download your profile straight into your new car. But a lot of this is catching up. BMW, well, you can download profiles. You onto can, the and, the, and the argument against it is I've already got a phone mm. that does all that stuff yeah. anyway. So just give me Apple CarPlay or Android. And Auto. then what happens when you run out of reception? You're out in the country. No mapping. Hey, yeah. Mercedes, how do I get well, the, the hell out of this place? Yeah. Yeah. Is, is this the auto <laughs> industry you know, getting over its obsession with Apple and, and Google? We're now going, look, we are actually, for, rather that's, than copying or borrowing that's uh, fine. and teaming up with you, we're going to go yeah, and no, no, that's way. fine. You know but what the counter argument well. is, though? The counter argument is a lot of people now are saying, I don't want Apple, for example, to know where I eat my dinner, what time I eat it, where I get my takeout from, where my dry cleaner is, all that stuff. Mercedes Benz is saying, well, we've got an option that. We'll take all that information and store it, and your smartphone company won't have to know that, if that's what you want. And Mercedes knows it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, Mercedes and then you have your phone in the car anyway. And we all know we can trust German auto manufacturers. <laughs> diesel. You go into the country, you will find diesel cars everywhere. But we're seeing less and less diesels on the road. Jez, what, what is the latest research and what are the numbers? Yeah, well, uh, Roy Morgan has been busy uh, compiling some stats and uh, you'll excuse me oh, for... He's gone uh, with an uh, okay. Yeah, diesel going through a bit of a uh, bad patch at the mm. moment. According to Roy Morgan Research, uh, d the uh, people, well, Australian, seriously considering diesel vehicles at the moment has slipped from 50,000, sorry, 50% in 2016 yeah, 50%, yep. to 45%. Okay, so, so that, it's that is a big slip when you consider that we're selling one million point, yeah, whatever. new cars a year. That's so five percent isn't in, insignificant. We've yeah. got over two million diesel cars on the road as we speak. I think though it's not so much that people are falling out of love with diesel. Uh, it's more to do with the fact that you have so many fuel efficient petrol engines now that you can have a petrol engine that's small capacity with a turbocharger. It mm. will use let's say six liters per hundred and the equivalent diesel might be five. I wonder whether those figures there are about medium SUVs and small, and then smaller cars. Because if you look at something like Prado, which mm. we've got in the garage here yep. at the moment, uh, they don't have a petrol engine anymore. That's right, they killed it. Everybody's buying diesel. Uh, dual cab utes are all diesel. Large SUVs mm. are generally diesel. Um, even from medium up, they're diesel. So I wonder whether these figures, you know, we went through a period yep. where people were buying i30 diesel, yep. um, mm. small Merc diesel, yep. small BMW diesels. I wonder whether, those petrol engines in those new generation cars, well, which are well, as good as they are. Well, I no longer yeah. because I've done my own Jess ah, Binks research. Here it is. <laughs> Passenger cars were down 21%. Wow. That's enormous. Wow. SUVs were down 8%. Okay. And yet... Low like commercials, just, yeah. up 6.5%. 6 6 and I just, got, I just got hammered in a story by a nameless reader <laughs> of Car Advice for saying that people were sheep and running out to buy SUVs. Well, there Rest you go. my case, Your Honour. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the other things, we get a lot of calls. Uh, we do uh, some radio shows where people call up, ask yes, questions. they do. One of the biggest concerns people have is to do with diesel particulate filters. So they'll go in, buy yeah. a new Subaru or something like that, and what they'll find when they get down the track, they're only driving around the city, maybe to the train station, the car will throw up an error because a mm. diesel particulate filter is designed to be flushed, yep. and it's flushed when the exhaust temperatures go up. It's and got it to be heated up. That's right. yep. They don't have a chance to do that because the engine doesn't meet the requirements. So people are getting weary about that. Add blue, yeah, costing extra money. Yep. So 
there are a lot of factors here and I think that diesel sales, I mean, unless you are in the country or driving one of these big SUVs that needs that torque down low, well, we, we've think. forgotten the fact that diesels originally were commercial vehicles. They yeah, were for trucks. That's they, true. They, you know, they were for commercial platforms. They were engines that were turned on at 7 o'clock in the morning and left running all day. They weren't necessarily always a great application for passenger vehicles. So yeah. maybe we're just coming to the point where people are reverting back to petrol because it's a better option. Well, and uh, don't forget the electrification factor. Yeah, well, that's that well, too. Yeah. So, you know, you know, manufacturers now merging yeah. the yep. traditional, you know, internal combustion engine yep. with an electric motor or more. Uh, you know, drivability is there, instant yep. response, cleaner emissions. Yes, well, one question for everybody out there watching at the moment, um, and, and this is just, uh, I'm going to throw it out there, we don't need to answer this now, but LPG, I am seeing less and less A, LPG yeah. cars on the road, but B, places where you can buy it. So please leave us a comment below and let us know whether you are seeing the same thing. Paul, very important car for Holden in Australia. I know you can't mm. tell us what it drives like because there's an embargo. New Commodore, you've had plenty of time to do with it pre-development and during the development, pre-launch, all that stuff. Tell us a little bit about it. What, what can we expect apart from everyone moaning that there's no V8 engine? Because <laughs> they're going to whinge. Mate, I'm genuinely getting sick of that. Yeah, and just a side painful, point. isn't it? 30% of sales yep. and declining were V8s. So yep. that is why there is no V8. So that means there's 70% of people yep. that weren't buying a V8. Correct. Yeah. So, so 70% no of people don't care about the V8 engine. Oh, uh, anyway. well, what about the rural drive factor? Uh, yeah, that too. Professor Bumpstop that's, over here. Yeah, that's, that's another Working thing. On <laughs> Let's not worry about that. So, all new Commodore, uh, yeah. the things that are important to know. Starting price, 33690 available in front-wheel drive and all-wheel drive. Now, the cool thing about the all-wheel drive system, it's a Twinster all-wheel drive system. Now, if that sounds familiar, oh. mm -hmm. Focus RS. Mm -hmm. Now, the best thing about this all-wheel drive system is the fact that it does mechanical torque vectoring. Mechanical torque vectoring is a real torque vectoring system. You'll see in a lot of brochures, oh, torque vectoring, mm -hmm. but it's fake. Already, yeah, it's like it's a brake bias. Yes, yeah, touching the brakes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a proper torque vectoring system. And the cars, the, certainly the pre-development cars we drove were fantastic to drive. I was most impressed with the two litre because it has lots of punch. We drove it back to back with a V6 Commodore. It was pulling away without even trying. And this is a front wheel drive two litre. On, on, on old Commodore, that 33 and a yep. bit starting price, how does that compare to the, the old one? So Holden's doing something a little different here. So the entry level will have a drive away price yep. fixed yep. from around 35,000. So yep. that's that's the big difference there. That will be targeted towards fleet. So we are looking at that as, as that aspect. Just like the Evoque, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, it is a big car, so in terms mm -hmm. of dimensions, this is quite similar to the outgoing Commodore. It is a bit smaller, boot capacity, five litres smaller, but the car that excites me the most, and I, I keep seeing this thing and I'm like, holy crap, it looks good, <laughs> yeah. it is the Tura. So that is the wagon, ah, right. lifted 20 mil higher, yeah. cladding on the wheel arches, mm -hmm. um, available with uh, petrol V6 and all-wheel drive. Same towing capacity as the last SS Commodore, so 2,100 mm -hmm. kilos. So mm -hmm. it is a good package from that point of view. Uh, you will see the review at caradvice.com on Thursday the 15th of Feb. So that's where you'll be able to get the full rundown. Got a video there as well. Keen to get people's thoughts. Yeah. Please, I mean, the, yeah. the Holden Whinge boss... Whinge about no V8. Go, exactly. go for your life. Do what everybody else has been doing. Yeah. The, the Holden <laughs> boss uh, is, is the one that came out and, and rightfully said, reserve your judgement for when you've driven it. So, I mean, do you agree yeah. with that? I Absolutely. Think a good point. I, most of the time, you know, we have the criticism a lot at caradvice.com. A lot of commenters will rab it on about a certain car. If you haven't driven it, pretty yeah. hard to have an opinion on it. So, yeah, if, you, and, if but, you're that keen, yeah. go and drive one and, and tell us what you And think. Holden's been involved, you know, reasonably early in the development of, yep. the, of the new yeah, Commodore. So, and, you know, comparing, I drove an Astra, a Vauxhall Astra in the yes. UK, and mm. I preferred the one that had been tuned by Holden Absolutely. in Australia. So, because those so guys they know they, what they're doing. Yeah, well, they know yeah, what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the big thing. The, the Holden guys here are doing all the tuning, and that makes this car all the more better. So from one Aussie engineered car to another, and this is one that's going to require a VB and perhaps yep. unbuttoning a few yep. shirts, the Ford Ranger Raptor. Oh, now, this sounds is, tough. Wow. Yes, this is pre-recorded and we have literally just received this now, information. It'll have more power, more torque. It'll, be, it'll have a bigger engine. Yep. It'll have better tow capacity because it's a Ranger Raptor. So it's got to be tougher than the Ranger. Yes, yeah. you would hope so. Yeah, but I'm unfortunately, hoping. I'm no. hoping. No, it doesn't. Oh, good. Uh, so under the bonnet of this thing, instead of the V6 turbo petrol that we thought it would have, it's a two-litre twin-turbocharged oh, diesel. Okay. So it's smaller than even the normal yeah. Ranger. 157 kilowatts of power, 500 newton metres of torque. You'd think that when they were penning this engine, they really would have a look at the competitors and go, we have to have more than everyone else. So let me get this straight. 
In the face of competition from Amarok now yep. and X-Class coming, yep. so both Volkswagen and Mercedes, both saying V6 turbo diesel with a big yep. whack in the backside of torque, uh, we're going to give you less. Yeah, and you're only matching Colorado. I mean, the Emirate also has a two-litre twin-turbo diesel, which is a yeah. very nice... But do, you know, do you know we're the only market in the world that, that is effectively carrying that? Because it doesn't... Some of the South American markets are, but in terms of major markets, because it doesn't meet Euro 6. Mm -hmm. So they've moved it on in Europe. Yep. But the V6 turbo diesel, it's the way to go for these trucks. If you want a yep. better tow capacity and you want better load carrying yep. and just, you know... I don't, I, this has got to be a lifestyle angle, surely. Yeah, look, it, it absolutely is. And it even comes down to things like towing it. It'll only tow two and a half tonnes oh. instead of three and a half, so you're right. already getting kicked in the, the nads over that. <laughs> yeah. um, but it is designed for off-roading. This uh, features Fox Racing shocks, 32.5 degree approach angle, 24 degree departure angle. You could literally find mm. a wall and just try driving up it, there <laughs> yeah. would be enough clearance. So it is serious. a cool looking truck. It is, um, it does yeah. look cool. And so we already know there's, uh, there's, a, there's a queue of punters for it. Oh, so. mate, it is out the door. They will mm. sell every one of these. Yeah. Uh, some other interesting points here. We first discovered uh, exclusively, exclusively mm. uh, during our spy photos, we had a look at the back of the car, looked under the skirt and discovered a Watts linkage. Now, if you don't know what a Watts linkage is, this is what it looks like. A Watts linkage is a device that allows the centre point to be the differential. You then connect that up to the sides of the car mm. and it prevents lateral movement within, yep. that, um, within that differential and also the, the drive wheels. That means you get better driving on-road, better driving off-road, and this car now ditches leaf springs in favour of coil springs. That's so interesting. like Navara. Yeah, it'd be like so, Navara and X-Class. Yeah, absolutely. And yep. ground clearance. I did my maths on this and was a little Which bit off. Which engineering class did you fail? Yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah, that because one. Because exactly. I was off by a few mil. Yeah, it was, yeah. I, I thought it was going to be about the high <laughs> 250 millimetre clearance. We're actually looking at 283 Ooh, millimetres. That's big. Yeah. That's that is big. huge. You're going to clear and, and a few rocks with that. Clear yeah. a few rocks yeah. and it'll give you better weighting depth yeah. as well. That's but I mean, impressive. picture that 30 centimetre ruler. Yeah. Yeah. You're then going to drive over that yeah. and you're not going to touch anything. That's pretty good. That is, mm. that is some pretty right. impressive Ford stuff. Ford Dakar Rally. Yeah. Here we go. Well, yeah. it could be. You never know. So, Ford Ranger Raptor, let us know what you think about it. Mm. All right, guys, thank you for those news items. Some very interesting stuff there. But now it's time to get on with it and the rest of the show. So I have a confession to make. Last year, I was the first person in Australia to destroy a set of tyres <laughs> on a Kia Stinger. And normally I would be perfectly proud of doing this, except this time it wasn't really my fault. Well, Kia I don't think it was my well, fault. Well, Kia still hasn't forgiven you. No, they haven't. But it, was, it made for cool footage. <laughs> it did. What I discovered when we were doing this was that stability control wasn't off. Even when it was fully off, I felt stuff going on. Now, if you didn't see the comparison we did with the SSV Redline, here is the section I'm talking about. Now, one of the downsides to the Stinger is that when you have stability control switched off like we do now, you find yourself an open piece of pavement like this, dip it in, bury the throttle, there's plenty of tyre smoke, but the stability control is still well and truly switched on. When we're starting to get quite sideways and we put in a bit of lock, I can feel it biting there and I can keep sort of adding power and it looks impressive from the outside, but it's not actually switched off. Whereas in the Commodore, off is completely off. So a lot of you guys like that video, and I know because 900 of you left comments there, but yeah. about 20 of you disagreed with that particular part. I disagree with the fact that you could be a professional drifter. Oh, mate, Having watched that, your career is no over. Chance. It's finished. No chance. Stun driver, surely. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I was doing yeah. all the work. Yeah. Now, you can clearly see in the video that something is going on with the wheels there. And those comments made it all the way through to Kia's head office in Korea. And it made it to the office of Albert Bierman. Now, that's <laughs> yeah. not a dude that produces beer. This is a guy that was <laughs> But did once... he say to you a bad tradesman always blames his tools? <laughs> is that what he said? <laughs> he was once in charge of BMW's M division. Right. So he worked on a whole stack of BMW Knows what he's doing. Cars. Bloody oath. Knows what he's doing. Then he was poached by Hyundai. Hyundai, Kia, same, same sort of parent group. Mm. And he's now in charge of the N division. So from M to N. And he has also worked on the Kia Stinger. So he assessed all this, or his office assessed all this, and asked Kia to go back and try the same test again. They hooked up all these computers and found that stability control is actually off. Well, I didn't want to just take their word for yeah, it. Right. I wanted to check that myself. So what we did was organise a BMW M3 Pure, because it's one that he worked on. By we, you mean you. Yes. You yeah. weren't there, were you? No, I wasn't no, there. I didn't no, see us were invited. Yeah, never saw it. We organised a BMW M3 Pure, and what I thought we would do is switch off stability control and put it through three tests. Then put the Kia Stinger through the same three tests. We know stability control off in a BMW is stability control off. And then we would see the results to see whether I was wrong, which mm. doesn't often happen. No, that's Trent, true. As yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So this is how it went. <laughs> to preserve tyres, we have wet down the track and set up three tests. We'll use the M3 as our performance benchmark. And with stability control off, we should see it whip around all tests without any electronic intervention. 
The first test is a donut around a set of cones in first gear. Test two is a first gear power slide around the cones. Finally, test three is a faster second gear power slide around the cones. As expected, the M3 passed all three tests with flying colours, but what about the Stinger? Right, so we've seen the BMW works. Mr. Beerman got it right. ESP off is ESP off. We're now in the Stinger. I'm going to switch everything off here. That is coming up now. So we're holding it for five seconds. Traction and stability control disabled. I'm going to manually select first gear and we're going to tip it in and see what happens. Bury the throttle. And around we go. There you go. <laughs> this is working well. I don't mind that. That is good. So tick for the donut. Okay, test two. First gear power slide. I'm going to get halfway through, punch the throttle. We'll see what happens. This is where I felt it intervening we did it in the yellow stinger. Ooh, okay. See, something happened there. Something happened there. It wasn't stability control though. We hit the limiter first to second. When I grabbed second, it, it sort of cut briefly and then it gave us torque again and we, we started spinning the wheels once more. So I have a feeling it could actually be the gearbox that's causing this. All right, we're gonna give that one more shot just to be 100% sure that it is actually the gearbox that's interrupting there. So come back into here, drop back to first, turn in, bury the throttle. There it is, just hit the limiter and then back to, to sliding again. Okay, so <laughs> it looks like it is the gearbox here, not stability control that's intervening. Okay, last test, second gear power slide. I'm gonna come into here in second, punch the throttle and we're gonna see what happens. So around it goes. Oh yeah, that feels all right. <laughs> that was good. So second gear, no dramas, it holds it fine. Even with some lock there, it wasn't intervening at all. Gearbox was happy, everyone's happy, and Paul is very happy. That looks like the look of defeat to me, mate. Mm. I think, Jezza, let's, let's first address the fact here that he's wrong. Oh. Yes, he was wrong, wasn't he? This doesn't happen often. Yeah. Let's just clarify that. How bit. does it taste, as Samuel yeah. L. Jackson would say? How does it taste? <laughs> it doesn't taste good. Yeah, exactly. But as you saw in the video there, um, donut, fine, no dramas. Mm. The first gear power slide was where we had mm. issues, and it's not stability control. No. And I feel kind of bad that Kia went back there and tested it themselves. Yeah, and, and you had to get another M3. And you, yeah, I mean, look, we're, we're having a go at you for being wrong, and he was wrong. We just go back there yeah. again. <laughs> However, it did do something weird. You yeah. could see it in the video, the way it snapped yeah. back into a straight line when it got into second gear. So is that acceptable? Uh, well, I mean, look, the, I think the key thing is, is that, you know, the Stinger is a very good driver's it car. Yep. It's just that the, the transmission is not a good driver's gearbox. You know, mm. you can't yeah. change gears properly. You don't have full manual control, even with the paddles. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and there's also an argument. Well, look, stability control, you know, you're not going to switch it all the way off yeah. uh, on the road, really. I mean, it's re that's really, no. it's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's a track thing. But as a customer, uh, no, but also, the key thing is, like, there's, you know, it's not intrusive when you're on the yeah. road if you do have that's the, true. Uh, the, that's a good the, the point, electronics actually. on. So, you know, that's, that's a big tick for the mm. Stinger. The, the thing that I find annoying is that as a customer, you could potentially go and do a, a a drift day or something yeah. like that. Mm. And if you're being let down by your gearbox, um, that's not a good thing. If they had just mm. stuck a ZF gearbox in there, yeah, a good German absolutely. gearbox, it would have been fine. Mm. And the way this, I mean, it changes up on its own, but yet still hits a limiter. So you could have just removed the change up function. Kia and, and Hyundai have been very dogmatic about developing their own gearbox, haven't they? Yeah. There, there are plenty of other options out there, but they're very, very keen to say, this is our own developed gearbox. And I, I don't know what the benefit of that is. To well, it's be all very well and good, but you kinda, you've got to make it better it's gotta be good, you know, yeah. than what's out yeah. there. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you guys technically agree I wasn't totally wrong, which we is agree good. that you were wrong, though. Yeah. But technically, it was mm. sort of the car. Have you had a call from Albert Beerman? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. He will get one. <laughs> Straight after yeah. this. He will get one. Despite large car sales dwindling, this car has an unprecedented amount of interest for it. It's your new Commodore, gents. We've been sitting down long enough. Shall we get up? Let's go and have a yeah, look. Let's do it. Walking frame trick. Well, that was a long walk, mate. At least 10 paces. And I personally, I find that offensive because motoring journalists don't walk anywhere. I'm not a, I'm not a walking tester. No, no, a they, test drive they cars. do. 
Yeah. Only if there's food yeah. or well, a fast car there. Well, there's no food here, mate. So well, much... We do have a nice car. Yeah, that's true. This is the all-new Commodore. The ZB is what they're calling it. Gents, mm. what do you think? What do you think from the outside? I think it looks pretty good. Uh, I reckon the styling's pretty good. Jezza, I think it looks as good, if not better, than the outgoing Commodore, surely. Yeah. Well, it's got some nice sort of Audi-esque... Uh pinches in the waistline. Yep. Uh, I'm always a fan of liftback yeah. sedans, yep. yeah, more practical. Well, practical, but Trent, do you want to hop in the back? Yeah, just in purgatory there where I belong. Let me know what the leg room's Lasso like. Lasso so myself. Obviously, in. this being a Commodore, it needs to be big on the inside. And at the moment, Jez, you've got your chair fairly far back. Yeah. My, Trent, can... what's leg room looking like? It's actually really good. I'm surprised by how much room there is. It might be marginally less than the outgoing yep. Commodore, but to be honest with you, it's, um, it's a pretty comfortable large sedan. There's plenty of headroom. Yep. The belt line's not too high, so visibility for passengers is good. Oh, I'm talking well, about uh, vision, Paul. Yep. You've driven a prototype. I get the sense that the A-pillars won't block your vision going right. around corners. You can actually like see when you drive now, which is handy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that helps, um, doesn't it? Speaking of driving, uh, obviously tactile environment inside the cabin. What are the materials like? Well, you know, you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, look, it's, uh, it's an Opal yep. uh, slash Vauxhall. And the good news there is where the Chevrolet source product, like the Equinox SUV, yep. I found that a bit disappointing, a bit of a mishmash of yep. plastics quality in here. Everything's far more harmonious, really nice sort of stylish dash design, locale, great yep. driving position. I can't wait to drive this thing. No, that's it. And uh, people are going to be surprised, and I think they'll be most surprised with this one. This is the entry-level 2-litre. If you're big on safety, buying this as a family car, safety will be important. And that's where this will come in handy. So the entire range gets autonomous emergency braking. And that is the technology that allows the car to stop on its own if you don't. And uh, as you move up the range, you also get pedestrian detection, which is where the car will work with uh, a stereo camera and also radar to bring the car up, even if you have a pedestrian. Now, speaking of pedestrians, Jez, can you flick the uh, bonnet for no, me, please? please? Thank you. Now, under here is the two litre engine, but more importantly, are these two sections up here. Now, what they do is if, uh, for whatever reason, I decide to try and mow Trent down in the car, um, <laughs> if the car doesn't stop me quick enough, it'll mitigate that speed if you're about to collect a pedestrian. But it has sensors in the front. So you can see here, if I land on this, it's all quite soft. But if the car is going fast enough to hit a pedestrian, it will detect that it's hit a pedestrian, and then it will fire these two cylinders here. And what they then do is allow the back of the bonnet to lift up, and that prevents the pedestrian from getting serious head injuries from the windshield. So this car is very safety conscious, very family friendly, and it seems to tick all the right boxes. We are looking forward to actually putting it through its paces and uh, seeing how it compares with the rest of its competitors. 2018 ZB Commodore. Mm. What do we think? Well, mate, it doesn't have a V8 engine. I uh, it's not rear wheel drive. I noticed. I'm a knuckle dragger. I'm not interested. Didn't even <laughs> look at it. I couldn't care less. No, look, seriously, it's, it's actually, I think it's actually a good looking vehicle. Mm. I reckon it's a stylish looking car. Uh, I like the look of it. I'm looking forward to having a drive of it yes. because as you've discovered, I think it's actually going to perform quite well. And I think if people look at it objectively, they will see a well styled, yeah. larger sized sedan, yep. you know, that, that's got plenty of room, looks good. Oh, I think it's a good looking thing. I uh, agreed on the design, definitely good design. Mm. I'm fan of lift backs. Yep. yep. So yeah, practical. Maybe your conventional sense. sedan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. It is a, that's a decent sized boot in there. I think you were saying it's like five litres yeah. just below. I mean that's litres. that's nothing. That's yeah. Yeah. Um, plenty of roomy in the in mm -hmm. the back, although I'm only a compact unit. But I, I think for me, like the interior mm. look, as as good a design as the interior was was a VF. Mm. Yep. You know, that's that is taking Commodore up yeah. uh, another level. It so, is. you know, that's you know, Opal slash Vauxhall are doing good things yeah. with interiors now. And after, you know, well, I jumped in the Equinox and I was like, oh, it's a bit you know, the interior. You mean of that you was, jumped backward into yeah, the Equinox? I kind of, yeah. Yeah. You know, there's some bits that are okay, but <laughs> the, I, but I jumped in that Commodore and I yeah. thought, you know, this is a really stylish yeah. dash. It's good. There's some tactility yeah. going on there, really good driving position. Mm. Yeah, it, it and I mean that that's the thing, they've nailed that stuff and features like as you move up to that Calais V spec. Heated and cooled seats with massage function. Heated seats for the rear. Yeah. Uh, in the Tura, you're also getting the big panoramic roof. I mean, it is loaded the Rear stuff. seats are a good point. I jumped in the second row of yep. the one we've got, um, which was behind the driving position yep. you had. We're about six foot one. There's plenty of room yep. in the second row. It is so it, it's not missing out on space for uh, second yep. row occupants at all. And how good is this for, for tech files out there? Uh, LED matrix lights. So they are the lights that will allow you to go high beam while you're following people in oncoming traffic. Oh. Uh, the Astra, which has pretty impressive LED headlights with this function, 16 modules, 
That thing has 32 yeah, LED a lot. modules. Oh, a lot. That is insane. That's yeah. like Audi BMW spec. Yeah. So that is some pretty impressive stuff. So you've always been wondering, and Trent, I know you asked me this this morning, <laughs> whether you can achieve the manufacturer's claimed mm. 0 to 100 time without using launch control. Uh, I tried it most recently with a Jeep Grand Cherokee Trackhawk, mm -hmm. you know, 6 million Modest kilowatt V8 vehicle. engine, yeah. why wouldn't you? Uh, I got within 0.1 of a second of the claim repeatedly, yep. 5 or 6 times with launch control and nowhere near it without. No matter what I did with the throttle okay. and how I modulated it, couldn't get near it. Okay, and Jez, you'll know as well, having used launch control before, that yeah. when you activate it in most of these modern cars, you'll sit there and it sounds like there's a mini hurricane <laughs> somewhere <laughs> erupting. But, and in some cars you have to disable stability control, so it's unsafe as well. Yeah, on the road. So, we wanted to put this to the test and we thought we would use our trusty BMW <laughs> M3 Pure. Yeah. What we did, we lined up a track with the BMW M3 Pure and we put it through three tests to see if we could get to the manufacturer's claim time of four seconds flat. Mm. That is very quick. This is what happened. Now, I don't know about your mates, but mine love bragging about how quick their cars are from zero to 100 kilometers an hour. You and I both know that those figures are only ever achieved with launch control. And if you rock up to a set of lights and need to give it a punch, you're not gonna sit there and do the 15 step dance to enable launch control. Today, I'm gonna to show you how launch control works. And then we're gonna see if we can match the manufacturer's time with and without launch control. And our weapon of choice is this, the BMW M3. Okay, so we've arrived to our theoretical set of traffic lights. The challenge is on and we need to get out of here as quickly as we can. We have the V-Box running, everything is still switched on. The only thing I'm going to do is put this into Sport Plus mode and just mash the throttle and we'll see how we go. So here we go. Looks up nice, a little bit of wheel slip. 100. Okay, that felt good. That felt good. I'm gonna keep the results till the end and we'll see whether it's quicker to do this with launch control. Step two, you think you're better than the car. This is where we're going to switch off stability control and we're going to let you do all the work. So some people think they're a little bit quicker than the car's electronics. We've turned off stability control. We're going to full throttle. We're going to hit the kick down and it's got a clutch dump function. So it'll hold RPM, let go of the clutch and then it's going to give 100% of torque to those wheels. This is a powerful engine, so I'm keen to see what happens. So here we go. Oh, that is tire smoke <laughs> and uh, that's an interesting time there so we got to 100 k's an hour there eventually uh, but it certainly didn't feel as quick as that first run okay this is the one you've been waiting for this is the trick up the BMW's sleeve this is how they achieve all these crazy numbers so to engage it we come to a complete stop we have to disable stability control again we then put our shift lever all the way up to its highest setting. The way launch control works is by dialing up a stack of revs. The car will then electronically manage the wheel slip so that you get maximum acceleration. So that is where the tires are rotating without spinning. Let's give this a shot. So foot on the brake, foot hard on the throttle, launch control active, using cruise control switch. I'm gonna up that to three and a half thousand RPM. Sounds so good. And I'm gonna let go of the brake and we'll see how we go. Oh, that is good. So I could not get the smile off my <laughs> face after test two. That was literally, oh, yeah. the only reason we didn't keep skidding and, and doing skids there was because <laughs> I let off the throttle at 100 k's an hour. Because you didn't want to destroy another set yeah, of tires. Yeah, it was still yeah. going sideways. Mm. That engine is bloody stupid. Mm. Like the fact that it can do four gears worth of burnout mm. is just testament. Once it comes on boost, it's just oh, nasty, isn't it? It is a weapon. Yeah, it's now, nasty. Now, let's get your votes in. Mm. If you were to pick which way is quickest to get to 100 kilometres an hour, and for any international uh, viewers, that's about 62 miles per hour. Yeah. Which method would you use? My gut instinct would be launch control. Yep, Jez? Yeah, launch control. Launch control. Okay, yeah. you'd be right. So, first test was without launch control. That's simulating, pulling up to the lights. You get there, you press Sport Plus to put it into its its best mode, and you just stand on the throttle. Away it goes. We had a little bit of wheel slip, but it got there 4.9 seconds. So, about 0.9 seconds off the mark. The second one, where we did about 200 metres worth of burnouts, <laughs> uh, was... How slow was that? 5.6 seconds. <laughs> I was expecting it to be slower. slower. Yeah. It wasn't, I thought it was about 10 seconds. Yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. That, that was interesting. But the quickest way was with launch control. Now, here's, here's the caveat here. 
Launch control was 4.6 seconds. So we're still about 0.6 mm. of a second yeah. off BMW's claim. Obviously, the tyres were getting a little bit shagged mm. by the mm -hmm. end of the day. Yes. They're the Continentals. You can get the optional Michelins. They're they'd stickier. Help. Yeah, they'd help. On top of that, you would have noticed that I was using the cruise control switch to adjust where we were launching from. I launched from about 3,500. You can go all the way up to 4. Right. Or you can go all the way down to about 2.2. Two. So if you were to notice it slipping, you could dial it back a bit so mm. that it would hook up. And you can see in the slow-mo there, you can see how the system works. It is incredible. So to limit the wheel slip, it's using traction control intervention. Yeah. It's using torque limitation. It is a, a very fine art to get that car going that quick. Yeah, so, it is. A lot of But power. still not four seconds. No, no. still not four seconds. So yeah. maybe we need to head back driver again. error, I would Correct. say. Correct. <laughs> Once yes. again, yeah. driver error. Yeah. Paul's wrong again. <laughs> he, can't, he can't even launch a car with launch control. Yeah, I mean, it's, exactly. it's, it's just yeah, four, isn't it? It's just embarrassing. What I will have to do is go back yeah. um, and with another, another set of tyres. Yeah, I great. want to be 100% yeah. sure. Well, that you definitely you can't I'll, underestimate the importance yeah. of tyres. And I'll, I'll, be looking in, I'll be looking in my junk email folder for the invitation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will invite you. Yeah, next sure. Time. Yeah. That is the end. It's time for us to row. And thank you to you guys out there for watching this. Obviously, without an audience. We're just sitting around, standing in front of some cameras. Which and is some what lights. we do every day. Yeah, we're just not in the office to working. Yeah, she is still on Facebook, by I the think way. She is, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, what we're going to be doing first Wednesday of each month at 8 pm is when you're going to catch Panel Beaters on Facebook, YouTube. We'll also put it up on Periscope. Yep. We want your feedback, so please let us know what you think of the show. What would you like to see? We will have a studio audience here next time. Uh, for you guys to get involved, mm. to see whatever car we have in the studio yep. and to ask any questions that Heckle, you have. throw things. Heckle, yeah. please we want to see you being wrong again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I doubt that will happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, thank you again for watching. Please let us know what your feedback is and any questions you have, stick around after the show. We're going to be live answering those. Uh, no question is too hard for us. See you next time. See you later. G'day everyone, thank you for tuning in to Panel Beaters. Uh, we're here, well I'm here at the moment to answer any questions you've got. Uh, if you have any feedback about the show, uh, let us know what you liked, what you want to see different for next time. Uh, we're always keen for your feedback. Did you enjoy the videos there with the Kia Stinger and the BMW M3? Uh, it'll be part of a new series we're calling Fact or Friction. It'll give you guys a chance to, uh, to come up with things you want us to test and you want us to find out whether whether things are true or false, uh, we will seek out to test those and, and to give you an answer. Um, one of the ones we've got coming up uh, that, that somebody has sent through and asked us is when police are talking about speed limits and they talk about uh, every K over is a killer, how does that compare from a new car to an old car? So if you've got a new Commodore, for example, doing 100 kilometers an hour, and then you've got a 30 year old Commodore doing uh, 100 kilometers an hour, which one takes longer to stop? Can there be extra speed in the newer car to compensate for that? We also want to find out how uh, how safe it is to overtake something like a big B double uh, when you're having to do the speed limit. So if the B double is doing 90 k's an hour, how long do you have to travel before you need to overtake, uh, as in passing the speed limit? Uh, is it safe to do? Uh, we're keen to get your feedback on that. I'll be here for a couple of minutes monitoring your comments. So please feel free to send through any questions and we will, uh, I'll answer them while I'm here. Each uh, Wednesday, the first Wednesday of every month, we're going to be doing panel beaters and uh, we're doing it in a pre-recorded format. So we're going to get you guys along as a studio audience and that'll be out of our Sydney office. We're planning on doing them out of Melbourne as well so that we can get a big uh, variety there. Uh, we, we really want to include you guys in all this stuff that we do. So uh, if there is anything you ever have or any feedback that you've got, uh, we're always looking forward to hearing it. Having a look at some of the comments from uh, today's show, a uh, question there from Stuart Frost, while the hatred of the new Commodore, it's not even on the road yet. It is, it is a good point there, Stuart, because uh, we are noticing a lot of people have things to say about the Commodore, which is great. People can have opinions. It's good that everyone has opinions. but. We want opinions that actually have some basis for fact, and that means you need to drive the car, and then you're welcome to an opinion. You can say whatever you want after that. Make sure you drive it first, and then you can say whatever you need after that. Uh, if there's anything else you want to know, uh, let us know in the comments below, and I'll be back shortly to answer your questions.
So we've got a couple of questions there that have come through, guys. So a question there from uh, Matt Bromfield. What sort of towing capacity, though? Two tonnes still? Uh, yeah, good question. It is still two tonnes. So the Commodore will tow uh, the same as the previous SS. So that was a big thing for Holden, making sure that they could develop a car that will still tow as well as the V8 model did because you didn't want to go backwards with that stuff. So 2,100 kilos with a braked trailer for the V6, and that's across Liftback and Tura as well. So that's the wagon. Uh, the, the other versions with the 2.0-litre petrol and the 2.0-litre diesel will only tow 1,800 kilos braked. And they're front-wheel drive, so you really want that assurance of the all-wheel drive system. We had a question here from um, from Umar Hussain. Uh, what's the update on the LCT? Well, unfortunately, there isn't one. And that, we think, is the most stupid thing on the planet because the LCT was introduced to kill... Uh, sorry, to, to preserve the local car industry, rather. Now that that's dead, uh, the LCT doesn't need to be there. We're not here to protect it anymore. Uh, it is a big source of revenue for the government. So like speed cameras and all the other good sources of income for the government, they're keen to keep it, regardless of how nonsensical it is. We're keen to get your opinion on that. Should the government be doing more to abolish the LCT? LCT. Um, comment there from Norm Ackland, diesel down 10% over two years. Yes, diesel is slowly disappearing. We're noticing as well with LPG, it's hard to spot LPG fillers around the place. I mean, they're, they're slowly disappearing and, and that is partly due to conversions being slower, uh, slower than usual. You don't really have any cars on the road now that are being converted. They're, they're quite efficient as they are. Um, uh, comment there from Zachary Ong, AdBlue is cheap as anyways, $100 for 10,000 kilometers. Yeah, it may be cheap, but it's one of those things, if you don't have a diesel car, you don't need to have it. Uh, and you've got to weigh up the cost. Diesels are often more expensive. And then by the time you add the cost of the diesel in, you then get the cost of the Ad Blue. It's almost cheaper to just get the petrol equivalent. A lot of them now with the small turbocharged engines are actually quite efficient and doing quite a good job there. Uh, let's have a look here uh, at some of these other comments. Um, mm -mm. So Norm Ackland, again, 100 kilowatts and 100 newton metres less than it deserves. That was in reference to the Raptor. Yeah, we kind of agree with that. Uh, it was a bit underwhelming there, especially wearing the Raptor name. If this is a car that's coming out in the US, you kind of want that thing to have a bit of meat to it. And uh, just being called the Raptor with no additional goods uh, probably won't work. We're tipping that that engine will make its way into the standard Raptor range as well. So it'll be interesting to see what is happening there. Guys, thank you for tuning in. Um, uh, we've got one more question here before we before we wrap up from Darren Etchells. Can we get an Audi RS3 on and put it through its paces one day, please? Absolutely. Uh, we do have a comparison on the side at the moment with the Audi RS3, the Mercedes-AMG A45, and the BMW M2. If you head to caradvice.com, you can see that comparison and see who took that one out. Um, thank you for tuning in again. Like I said, Panel Beaters will be back first Wednesday of every month. We are going to be looking for a studio audience and some video ideas. So if you do have any, please feel free to send us an email. But keep an eye out for our request for a studio audience. We'll get you into our brand new studio and you can uh, see that filming process. Uh, thank you again for tuning in and uh, please don't forget to drive safely.